Hi, I'm Robert from Manhattan Wood Project. I've had my X-Carve CNC set up for a couple weeks now. I've done a few projects on it, and I'm very happy with it. I didn't always follow the directions that Inventables had put online. Sometimes I had to kind of make my own stuff up, but overall, the build process was very easy and pretty well documented. I was very happy with how much documentation there was. I just wanted to share the little tips, techniques, and modifications that I made during the build process just to help anyone else who is building their own next carve or even considering one. Maybe this will help you squeeze just a little more awesome out of your machine, or at least prevent some potential problems down the road. Now, I did an initial review video that you can click on right up here that may also come in handy. It addressed a few of the minor issues that came up. I'm going to try not to repeat what's in there too much, so check it out when you get a chance. I've divided the tips up into their individual steps, which you can skip directly to over the next 10 seconds if you're watching this on YouTube. Or you can watch them all in a row without clicking on the steps. I recommend the second option. One corner of my wasteboard was slightly damaged during shipping. I fixed it by forcing a little glue into the cracks between the layers and clamping it until it was dry. I've been doing some forum stalking at Inventables.com and picked up a few supplies to make some modifications or to make this assembly a little bit easier. Picked up a piece of 3 16th inch steel and some furniture bolts to basically help fortify the x-axis. Five different colors of electrical tape. The electronic scale, it's for fish, but I figure I can probably use it to get a good tension on belts. I bought a couple of e-stops to build into my cart here from Inventables himself. A bunch of different sizes and colors of heat shrink tubing. Some uh, more chocolate blocks that I can put on my cart. The good thing about these is they have a nice cover and a good recess in there so that I can attach these to the cart. Got a quarter inch ferrule, I guess something so that I can put quarter inch bits in, theoretically. We'll see if it works. I got it off Amazon, not in Venables. And then over here, a bunch of ferrules and a ferrule crimping tool. What you do with these is you take and you put a piece of wire in the ferrule itself, crimp it down with these, and that gives you a good solid connection so you don't have little strands going everywhere and uh, basically short circuiting or breaking. So I use these at work all the time. I love them. They're fantastic. And then the last thing I got was some 22-2 shielded wire to uh, basically extend my limit switches and minimize interference from the stepper motors. One thing that I read in the forums while putting the V-wheels on with the eccentric blocks you want to put a little bit of Loctite on. So I have some blue removable thread locker here. So I'm going to have to stick this up and inside. What I'm doing is I'm just kind of putting a little bit right along there. That way I know my eccentric nut is going to have to go through it. And then tighten down using the wrench and the Allen wrench. The names on the instructions don't necessarily match the names on the uh, bags. So you can always look at the SKU number, match them up. So the next step has me tapping these two holes on this maker slide, which it looks like this drill bit was put in here just to drill it out, ream it out, but it it's already drilled to the right size. So I'm going to use some I'm going to use some WD-40 and the supplied tap and start uh, tapping these holes. WD-40 is real easy. I already have some. Just push down the button a little bit. You can get a nice little bit of a uh, cup full of oil. And then I'm just going to swish the end of the tap around in it. And then go to town. Make sure your tap is uh, as straight as you can really get it when you start cutting the, the threads. So you start cutting your threads, pull it back after a turn or two just to kind of break off the shavings. 
and then keep going. And if you're worried about it uh, starting to get bad, then take it out, put some more WD-40 on it, squirt it in or dip the tap in the cup and keep going. So you only have to tap it far enough for these screws to go in. So you don't have to take it all the way to the very end. When you're done, your tap will come out loaded with chips. Pre-bed right there. All you have to do to get rid of them, swirl it around in the WD-40. And now you have a lubricated bit and no chips on it. I'm getting ready to put the belt together. So what I'm going to do to keep it from slipping, I have a piece of small shrink wrap tubing here. I'm going to put that on. Maybe. There we go. Kind of slide that up and out of the way. And then I'm going to thread this through belt clip the way the directions show. And then just push this shrink wrap back up and over. I would say it's quarter inch shrink wrap, but I'm not certain. So there's just a little bit of it sticking out right there. And now, use a uh, heat gun, in this case, a big one, and shrink down the shrink wrap. You can tell that you did a good job with the heating when you can kind of see the a little profile of the teeth right here on the sides. That is shrunk down very nice right there. So now what that did is that basically locked all of these teeth together so I can pull and th that lower belt's not going to slip out. Now just to make sure these are extra secure, I'm also putting two small zip ties on. So it may not be necessary with the uh, shrink wrap, but I'd rather make sure that it's good then let it slip and mess up something that I've been working on for hours. So put those on. And then cut off the tips. Now I have this stretched pretty tight. It's really difficult by hand to get this in and through to the hole. But, I got a set of these uh, pliers, put some tape on the end so I don't scratch anything. And then, all I have to do, keep the screw lined up. And then, just push it through. Get the nut on a couple turns. And now I can just sit here and tighten it. So I'm going to try setting tension on these belts the same instead of listening to the guitar hum and making them sound the same. I'm going to try something a little bit better. I got this little uh, fishing scale for something like seven or eight bucks on Amazon I think. So I have this pushed all the way to the end. I'm going to put the hook through about mid-span. And then I'm going to uh, pull it up one inch. And I'm going to measure what the, how much force it took to lift it one inch. That looks like it's just about six pounds. It's not exact, but it's uh, good enough. It'll give me some relative values. And if it slips, then I know I need to tighten it up. If it has a hard time running, I know I need to loosen it. So there's a video that addresses how to attach the M8 spindle rod, but there's not one that addresses how to attach the Acme spindle rod. I'm going to pretty much assume that it's the same. You have your Delrin nut, you need to run it up and down your uh, threaded rod a couple times just to kind of break it in. And then from there, you push the small end of the Acme thread up and through, put your pulley on, and then hand thread the little lock nut on top. 
Now you're not going to be able to lock the uh, lock nut down until you attach these two little screws into the pulley, just like you did with the other two pulleys. It doesn't address that in the instructions either. What I would recommend is that uh, XCarve make an instructional video on how to do this for the Acme thread as well as the M8 thread since they are slightly different in procedure. Now that I have one little bolt in, put the second bolt in. Now I'll tighten them down using what they called moderate force earlier. And now while I'm holding these set screws, I can tighten down the lock nut on top. So there does not seem to be a very good way to do this. Uh, maybe a little grip can be added somewhere. I don't think this has to be torqued uh, to star torque. I think just fasten down until you're worried that you're going to break your little uh, wrench will be more than enough torque to hold it on. In this part of the z-axis motor step, I'm supposed to align this pulley with this pulley. Now it says to put the bolts in loose, hold this and then tighten it up and make it flush. What I did was I just tightened two opposite bolts to hold this flat on the top of the plate. And now I'm going to go in and adjust the pulley height until it is about the same height. So I'm just looking across the top of this plate and when, the, when this looks like it's about the same height, then I can go in and tighten the set screws. Now if you really want to get anal retentive about it, you can take a small scale, something like this, and uh, run it across. And that tells me that I need to bring this up just a fraction ta taller. That right there should be nice and flush. Now, since I can't get this around, that's when I'll come back in, loosen up these bolts just a little bit so I can slide the motor back and forth and then I can slip the belt on and if I need to tilt this like looks like I may need to then I can loosen these bolts up so that I can just kind of tilt it a little bit more like that so I think it's a lot easier to do it than it would be to uh, sit here and try and set the pulley by, high, by eye with one hand while your other hand is holding the motor. And there we go. And now all I have to do is take, make sure the uh, belt is actually on both pulleys. Take and spin and make sure that all the teeth are actually gripping. And then tension it. Since it doesn't say to how much to tension the belt to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all these bolts to uh, basically quarter turn off tight and then push the motor back with one hand while I am pushing or while I tighten the one bolt with the other hand. That way I have a minimum of messing around to do with these things. So I'm going to stick this back here, kind of act as a little bit of, of a wedge. I can put this on there. So this part could be done a little bit easier. Done with uh, done with another body, but it's possible to do it with one hand. So right there, nice and tight. And now just tighten the other bolts in a uh, cross pattern. I'm ready to do some wiring. I bought some value packs of different size uh, shrink wrap and ferrules on Amazon. They're nice and cheap and they're great for use with wiring. One of the little tricks that I've picked up at work is that if you have a bunch of wires, you can either zip tie it, which kind of looks ugly, or you can just use some shrink wrap, which you can usually write on the shrink wrap. So since there's a color code to the wires, uh, red, blue, green, black, how they go into all the terminals, I'm just going to use that for X, Y, Z, and maybe spindle. I don't know. So let's write on here X stepper. So X step written right there. 
And then before I even cut any of the wires, I'll put it on there, kind of kind of bundle them together like that. And then I can use the heat gun to shrink it down. So now I know where those wires go to and it helps kind of tame them until I can put them back in the order they're supposed to go. So here's how I tend to wire. I'll, I'll run the wire to the length that I need it to be. Cut it off. I'll do this individually. I prefer not to cut three or four wires at once because inevitably you'll mess it up. Right now, all these stranded wires, if you were just to lock them in the terminal, uh, some of them could break. They'd kind of get wound up. You may not get very good contact. So I'm going to put them in this little ferrule. Sometimes you have to twist the strands to get them in the ferrule. And then after they're in, use a little ferrule crimping tool, tighten down. And now this wire is not coming out and the individual strands are protected. So I can put this in my terminal block. And just out of habit, I tend to put my uh, things in terminal block on the right hand side the direction they'd be pulled down if they were being when you're tightening so now you're crimp uh, pulling down the ferrule smashing a little bit but that's okay it just means you have great contact one of the problems that's been mentioned a few times is that the stepper wire is just long enough to get from where you need it there's no slack and if you cut it wrong you're pretty much uh, screwed until you get more wire so I'm actually going to wait as long as I can to cut it instead of cutting it into a couple 12 inch or 12 foot pieces, seven foot and a five foot, I'm just cutting it to length. This is the piece of wire that's coming over from the Y stepper, coming over to the left Y stepper and basically gets tied together with this. So I'm going to cut this to length as I need it here and just see how, see if I can do that with the rest of everything. Now another little trick I've learned when I'm dealing with uh, wire that has foil uh, shield and actual shield wires in it, I'll, pick, I'll put my label, in this case the uh, heat shrink, on above where I want to cut it off and then remove everything and then I will take the name plate, push it down maybe this far over and then heat shrink it. And that way it looks a lot neater rather than having this uh, end showing with a little bit of foil, maybe a little bit of this shield wire sticking out. So this just kind of covers all sins. Let's talk limit switch wiring. So the wire that they give you is unshielded, uh, double wire, but uh, kind of put together like this. A lot of people in the forums are talking about how having the limit switch wiring uh, going so near the spindle and maybe even near the stepper motors, uh, sometimes there's enough uh, electromagnetic field or something apparently to cause it to uh, sometimes trip the limit switches even though there's not actually something touching it. So uh, I went out and bought a uh, 100 foot roll of 22-2 shielded uh, wire, basically typical hookup or uh, communications wire. So that not only has the same uh, white and black wire, but it also has a uh, grounding, little grounding wire here, little shielded wire, plus it has a foil shield that goes around it. And that should be enough to uh, keep from having spurious limit switch trips just because of the spindle working hard or the stepper motors working hard. I had a friend come over that has some certifications in soldering to show me how to do it right. He had a few tips. Whether you're tinning a wire or soldering a connection, flux is your friend. There's no such thing as too much flux. You want a little solder on the tip of your soldering iron to help with heat transfer. That's called tinning the tip. It's perfectly acceptable to add excess solder to the tip of your iron and transfer it to whatever you're soldering, as long as you're heating up the connector enough to draw the solder down. Otherwise, you're just dropping a ball of solder on the cold connector. That's bad. A properly tinned wire still has individual strands visible. 
If you're soldering a stranded wire to a connector, it's sometimes easier to tin the wire, then form it into a hook, then solder the wire to the connector. When you're wiring up your limit switches, you want to pay very, very close attention to the directions. They say to wire the white wire to the middle connection marked NO for normally open, and the black wire to the connection closest to the lever marked C for common. That's all well and good until you try and use one of their pictures as a reference and realize that one switch is hooked up that way while another one isn't. What you need to do is just find where it says NO and C, no matter where they are on the switch, and don't assume the picture will show you how to wire it correctly. Now it's time to put all of these wires through the drag chain. So what I did was I took and taped them all together. Uh, when you do this, use a lot of tape, don't skimp on it. And have one wire kind of leading the way instead of a big old bundle in front. Just have one sticking out a little bit. Uh, this, some of these are longer than others in the back, but it won't matter because once I get it to the other side, I can just pull them individually. Uh, doing it like this and then just gently feeding them will uh, be sufficient to get this through. So I had a uh, set of screw bits. I have a five millimeter bit right here. And what you do is you just take, put that on, thread it in, and I have the torque on this, on my drill here, a little Ryobi torque set to seven. So whatever that comes out to, just put it on, drive it down, and it seems to go down just perfectly. Now even though this is a magnetic uh, tipped uh, holder. I found that this does tend to stick in the threaded inserts a little bit, but that's not too much of a problem. I'm not worried about it because this makes it go so much faster than it would going by hand. Now let's see how much easier this is with a uh, fish tape. So much easier. So, if you have a fish tape, I recommend pulling the wires through with that. Important note, the drag chain on the Y side is supposed to go under, not over. So that means I need to take this off at this joint, flip it all over, and then try and connect it. So, it's not going to be a problem, but the instructions did not say that it goes under. It just said run the wires through and connect it to the bracket. So that's one little uh, hiccup that it's not a problem but something that can be avoided. Uh, get the drag chain off. I'm just using the little jeweler screwdrivers that were provided and once you get one going you should be able to get the other one moving. There you go. So let's see how easy it is to just flip this without really messing up wires. Not too bad. Now that's snapped on. Run this under. And connect it over here on the front. After putting together the drag chain, I ran the wires through a hole I drilled into my custom CNC carts tabletop. I put a layer of heat shrink on the separate wire bundles to keep them separated from each other and to protect them from the rough sides of the hole. I connected them to terminal blocks I put inside the cart so I had a location where I could disconnect the wires without having to take apart the power supply box. Remember, Flux is your friend. So are pictures.
I assumed the receiving 40 pins meant that I had to try and put pins in all the places where they went on the G shield. I assumed wrong. Make sure you don't waste your time by putting pins in the wrong holes, because otherwise your board won't fit in the enclosure. You can use isopropyl alcohol to clean remaining flux and contaminants off your board and solder connection after it's cooled down. This is easily done with a flux brush with the hairs cut short. At one point, you're supposed to connect all three black wires from the limit switches and put them in a single connection. We chose to solder all three wires to a short extension piece and then put heat shrink over the solder connection. That made it much easier to deal with. It was unclear in the directions where some of the wires were supposed to connect. I'll try and clarify that right here. The wires that go in the connector for the pins you soldered are, from left to right, blank, white X limit switch, white Y limit switch, yellow spindle logic, white Z limit switch, blank, black spindle logic, and blank. You'll notice I did not say anything about the black limit switch wires. Those get crammed into the big green ground connection marked G and E for ground, along with the black fan and spindle power wires. The big green box also has a connection marked v moat which gets the red fan and red spindle power wires. Before you screw your fan down, connect the wires and make sure you position the fan so it's blowing air into the enclosure. So this is cool. There's the x-axis being moved by me the Y, and then the Z, which the Z is just me screwing this spindle up. Calibration was really easy. If you have a good carpenter square that's truly square, you can clamp it to the Z axis and then just tighten the applicable bolts that'll keep it from coming out of square. If you're not sure if your square is actually square, you can always move the square to the other side of the Z axis, look for any error, and then adjust to cut that error in half. When you do your test card, if you see an error that says the bit's too large, then either put in a bit with a smaller tip or make the font size larger. If you don't, your test card will end up like this, with missing segments. I wasn't too worried about it and ran it as it was just to see what would happen. There is no damage, it just couldn't cut some of the segments. So I hope some of these tips and techniques helped out. The assembly really wasn't that difficult, it just took some time and patience. I avoided a lot of potential problems just by stalking the forum at Invenables.com. I'd suggest spending a couple hours there just browsing through the various forum topics. Not only will you better acquaint yourself with the machine, but maybe you'll pick up some potential projects. Now please don't forget to share, comment, and give thumbs up to this video. And if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to Manhattan Wood Project on YouTube. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you on the next project. If you liked this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up. If you really liked it, or if you like my channel, please consider subscribing. You can hit the big subscribe channel below, or hit my little logo up here. Also, please consider subscribing to my upcycling channel, Round Trip Upcycling. You can just click on the logo right up here.